welcome to First Chapter Friday, where every Friday I read the first chapter of a book I think you just might want to finish. My name is Kathy. I'm a librarian with the Palo Alto City Library, and this week our book is called Finding Langston. It's by Lisa Klein Ransom, and the reason I chose this book is because February, which is where we are now, is Black History Month, and this one is historical. It takes place in the 1940s. It is about a black character um, who learns about a black historical person, Langston Hughes, and it's written by a black author. So it really fits in well with Black History Month. On top of all that, it's a really good book. So here's what it says on the inside cover. When 11-year-old Langston's mother dies in 1946, he and his father move from Alabama to Chicago's Bronzeville. Langston must leave behind everything he cherishes, family, friends, grandma's Sunday suppers, even the magnolia trees mama loved so much. The northern city is noisy and hectic, and their kitchenette apartment is just a lonely room with old newspapers covering up the holes. At school, Langston is tormented for being too country, but his new home has something his old one did not. Unlike the whites only library back home, the George Cleveland Hall Library welcomes everyone. There, hiding out after school, Langston discovers another Langston, a poet whose words are powerful. In one of his poems lies a secret that will bring Langston closer to his mother's spirit. So here we go with Finding Langston. Chapter one. Never really thought about Alabama's red dirt roads, but now all I can think about is kicking up their dust. I miss the hot sun on the back of my neck and how the racket of cicadas seems like no sound at all. At the end of a school day, before I had to get home and do my chores, I could take my time walking just as slow as I pleased without someone pushing past and cutting their eyes like I was a stray dog come asking for scraps. The school bell rings loud, and I remember I'm a long way from Alabama, dirt roads, and slow walking. I grab my satchel and make my way fast down the stairs, through the schoolyard, past block after block of the cracked sidewalks of Chicago's south side. I step quick past Binga State Bank, the Jackson Funeral Home, and Saul's Butcher Shop with rows of bologna lined up in the window like a curtain. I wish it were home I was rushing to. Instead... I'm hurrying to get as far away as I can from Haynes Junior High School. I sidestep a group of loud-talking women outside the Lux beauty parlor and a tired old man with round shoulders. Just like in Alabama, the folks here are in all shades of brown. So many they call this part of Chicago the Black Ghetto or the Black Belt. But of all the names this place is called, I love the name Bronzeville. A place filled with people, each one some color of bronze. Finally, I re reach 4501 Wabash Avenue. At my building, I sit on the stoop and catch my breath, waiting before I have to climb the broke down stairs and walk hallways smelling like two-day-old garbage and fried onions. Waiting alone for Daddy in our kitchenette apartment. Landlord calls it an apartment, but it ain't nothing but a room tucked in between and on top of a lot of other rooms. Nothing here belongs to us, just whoever pays the rent. The two beds, two old rickety chairs, one table, the bureau missing a drawer, nothing. And the walls covered by the last tenant with old newspapers to hide the holes. When we first moved in, I tried to read the headlines, but there's so many layers, all I could make out was a few words and pieces of dates. July 12, November 7, 1945. Didn't really matter, because news from a year ago ain't really no news at all. This room is so small, it feels like I'm being squeezed from all sides. Daddy ain't the best company, but ain't nothing worse than being alone. Not used to coming home to an empty house. The smell of last night's dinner and Daddy's sweaty work clothes hanging in the air. Every day I open the door, it takes just a minute, for I remember I won't hear Mama getting supper started, or hear, hear her humming. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And just a little bit longer to remember, I won't see Mama ever again. Our downstairs neighbor comes out, her two kids hanging tight to her. Looks like she's got one more on the way. 
The one in her arms is crying so loud, I gotta cover my ears. Daddy says folks in the North like to keep to themselves, so I guess that's why they never speak. I wouldn't know what to say if they did. Been here months now, and we still only know one neighbor by name. Sometimes I wish we didn't. Miss Fulton comes up the steps, struggling with a bag. Come help me, she says when she sees me sitting. Looks like I'll be going inside after all. Her plump hands pass me her bag. She lives on the top floor, across from us, and only time she talks to me is when she's asking for my help. More like telling me to help. Get over here, and I need you to. I don't think she even knows my name. In Alabama, I was raised on please and thank you. Ain't no way Mrs. Fulton's from Alabama. Daddy says she's a teacher in a high school across town. Bad as my classroom is, I'd hate to be in hers. She's just about my mama's age, just as pretty, but she's as wide as my mama was narrow. Her freckled light skin, nothing like my mama's smooth nut brown. Mean as my mama was kind. And she's missing mama's gap tooth smile. Uppity is what folks back home would call her. In other words, I ain't got no business thinking. Following her up the stairs, I can barely see around her wide behind, swaying from one side to the other. She puffs all the way up the four flights. Every once in a while, she stops to catch her breath. You okay, Miss Fulton? I ask, almost wishing she don't make it to the top floor. Mm-hmm, she answers, grabbing onto the rickety banister and keeps on going. Me right along behind her. Miss Fulton takes her sweet time getting her key out of her purse, like I ain't standing there with heavy groceries. Finally, she opens the door and I barely make it to the kitchen table. Careful with my things, she says loud. Yes, ma'am, I say, half dropping the bag. I look around wishing our apartment were this neat. It's only one room with a small table pushed against a wall with a flowery oil cloth spread on it. Smells like the lavender that grew along the edge of our road back home. A lace curtain hangs at the window and pictures of people with smiling faces in frames hang above the table. Daddy keeps a picture in his wallet of him and Mama all dressed up. He'll show if I ask, and if he's in the mood for showing. The other corner of the room has her bed and quilt bright with patches of color. Even with the big stove that sits in the middle, black and ugly with who knows how many years of other folks' grease and dirt cooked in, it still feels like a home, like what I used to have. Good day, ma'am, I say, backing out the front door before she finds something else for me to do. I pull the key to our apartment out of my shoe and wriggle it in the lock. After I lost two because of the holes in my pants pockets, Daddy said I'll lose another. I just wait outside till he gets home. The metal scrapes my foot all day, but at least I'm not waiting outside. Back home, never had a key. The door stayed open. Every day in Chicago makes it harder to remember Alabama like a candle fighting to stay lit in the wind. But I do remember the porch and the front porch with no lock, creaky, unrusty hinges. And of course, I remember Mama pulling me in close and burying her nose in my hair as soon as I walked in the door. I pull a chair up to the window and watch the goings-on downstairs. Bet there's more action on my street than in Cab Calloway's show at the Regal Theater on Saturday night. The cart man rolls by with his busted wagon collecting trash and tossed out furniture. Two soldiers stroll past, looking like they're still on duty when everyone knows the war ended a year ago. Jackie and Shirley from school are turning the ropes for double dutch on the sidewalk. Here comes Sally sitting in the alley. They sing to two girls in the middle jumping fast. Shirley's ponytail bobs in time to the ropes hitting the sidewalk. Jackie looks bored with her head tilted to the side, eyeing boys passing by. Some people are moving in across the street. The mother wears a dress too thin for the weather, reties her head rag, and lifts her two young ones out of a truck onto the sidewalk, while a tall, skinny man and his boy, just about my age, untie the chairs and pots and everything else they own from the back of the truck. The boy looks as scared as I did the day we moved on to 4501 Wabash. Daddy comes walking tired and slow from the L train that rides on a track above the city. He nods to folks as he passes. He's so tall, folks gotta look up to see his face. Some nod back, some keep walking. I move the chair back and shut the window. 
By the time Daddy opens the door, my books are open wide and spread across the table. I take out my pencil and pretend I'm doing my schoolwork. It's a short book, but a good story. So I hope you'll give it a try. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you can come back another Friday for another first chapter of yet another book. Goodbye.